Welcome to lecture 5.8. Here we're going to cover the chair flip. Now, as the last section in the isomerism unit, we're going to discuss how the cyclohexane ring and the chair structure actually has two different conformational isomers. Now, to understand this, let's look at an example of a flat projection, this molecule here with its two methyl groups, its one isopropyl group, and its chlorine. And we're going to take one example here of drawing the chair. And I'll propose a different drawing of a chair that looks and matches the original flat perspective. So starting here, I've numbered the carbons 1 through 6, and we'll add the groups one by one in red. So on the first carbon, we see a methyl group on a wedge. That indicates that from the top view of the ring, we see it coming towards us. So in that case, this is going to have to be the axial position, as on the carbon 1, the axial position is going straight up. So the methyl group can be placed here on the axial position. On carbon two, we see it going on a dashed line. On carbon two, this is a down carbon where the axial is going down, which means that the methyl group will be placed there. So the equatorial positions here are held by hydrogens. Now, looking at carbon three, we see that it is also on a dashed line going away from us. Now, on carbon three, we can see that this carbon is pointed upwards. The axial position is going upwards, which means that the down position that is held by this isopropyl group must be on the equatorial position. That's going to be perpendicular to the lines on the side and look something like this. Excellent. Now, for our last substituent, we'll look at number five. We see the chlorine is on a wedge coming towards us, and that's going to be on an up carbon here. So we can add the chlorine axially. And so what we have here is two axial methyl groups, an axial chlorine, and an equatorial isopropyl group. So that's great. That looks and matches what our ring is. But take a look at this structure. Now, we can see that if we look at the first carbon, the methyl group that was axial is now equatorial. However, taking that same top perspective, we can see that it is coming up towards us. Now, this is done because carbon one has switched locations. It's now down here. But we'll get into more detail on how this is done in a second. Going to our second substituent, we can see that it used to be down and axial, and now it's equatorial. However, since this position on carbon two is axial, and it go, it's going up, that means that this methyl group is still going down. So it seems like we're able to still represent this flat projection using this structure. To finish up the last two substituents, we can see that the equatorial isopropyl group that was going downwards is now still going downwards, but axial. And lastly, the chlorine that was going up and axial is now going up and equatorial since the axial position is going down on that carbon. So from these top perspectives, we would actually see the same flat projection. And these are what we call the chair flips of the cyclohexane ring. And these are actually able to interconvert with each other. Now, again, they are very similar. They have the same molecular formula, but they're different in the way that these atoms project, either axial or equatorial. And that can affect the stability of these rings. So let's break down how these chairs are able to interconvert. Now, to understand this, let's take that initial view of the chair that we brought before, which is the idea of identifying a headrest and a footrest carbon, as well as a flat sitting area. Now, in this case, I prefer to uh, draw the headrest and footrest like so. And what we're going to do to understand the chair flip is Imagine we took the footrest and folded it like an envelope along this crease here. Now, leaving everything else the same, we would no longer have a headrest and a footrest. We would instead have what would appear to be two headrests. So if I was to pull that carbon up, I would get something that looks like this. So carbon one is still here. It's still our headrest. But now carbon four has been pulled up to the top. That leaves carbon two and three connecting them, and carbon five and six connecting back, with our dotted lines drawn something like this. So this is an unstable intermediate. 
Now, the reason it's unstable is actually uh, the torsional strain along this bond. If you have a model kit, you can take a look and see that you're actually going to have eclipsing bonds uh, between 5 and 6 and 2 and 3. But for now, we'll, we won't go into that much detail. It's unstable, and we like to call it the boat conformation. So this is the boat conformation. We could call this the first chair flip. Now, from this point, you can imagine that we can go right back just by taking that same original footrest and pulling it back down to where it was. However, we have another option now. We can imagine that we take this original headrest and pull it down instead. And this is going to get us our second chair flip, as we saw above. Now, for ease of drawing and making them look distinct, what I like to do here is to draw the original lines of my chair. These were slanted down and to the left. Now I'm going to slant them down and to the right. You don't have to do this, but it does make the chairs look distinct. Then you can continue drawing the rest of your chair. And this is why I really like the headrest and footrest idea. It's very important that you don't leave carbon 1 at its original location. You can see that we kind of pulled carbon 4 up to the top left, and we pulled carbon 1 down to the bottom right. And so that's going to kind of shift the numbering by one carbon. So we'll have 1, 2, 3, and 4, 5, and 6. And you can see that now the original footrest has become the headrest on carbon 4 as it's pointing upwards. And the original headrest is pointing downwards as the new footrest. And you can imagine that you can just flip these again to go back to the original chair flip. So that's how a chair flip is done. But what's important about them, and the mo probably the most important thing to recognize about the chair flip, is that they have one distinct difference between them. And that's that when you do a chair flip, or when you flip, all axial positions become equatorial. And vice versa, all equatorial positions become axial. So these positions on the ring can actually change. Now, looking back to our original example, we can see how that was the case here. All of our axial positions, which I'll circle here, became equatorial. So that's the chair flip. And hopefully this metaphor with the headrest and footrest can help uh, elucidate how that occurs. Now let's cover one quick common mistake that I see a lot of students make. And it's actually a mistake that I made uh, a few times before I figured this out when I was taking the course. So here we have a chair with a chlorine on position one, and that's going up an axial from the top view, and the methyl group going down axial. So a common mistake would be to draw the line slanted the opposite way and say, oh, well, we know that axial becomes equatorial in a chair flip, so that means that the chlorine became equatorial. And same with this axial methyl group, it too became equatorial. So this may look good. We have changed all the axial positions to equatorial. But let's draw this in the flat projection again to see if we've made any differences. On carbon 1, we see that there's a chlorine, but it's going equatorial away from the eyeball. It's going away from the top view, so into the page. We would use a dashed line to represent that. For our second carbon, we see that the methyl group is going up axial, or sorry, up equatorial, as the axial group is going down. That means that we would use a wedge to describe it. But as you can see, these two flat projections are actually not the same. More specifically, these are a type of stereoisomer, which we'll cover in the next unit. But for now, just be aware that these aren't the same. Looking up at the original example that we used, Remember that the flat projection most must directly correlate to both structures in terms of the wedges and the dashes. So to solve and to avoid that issue, make sure that you change the numbering of your carbons or imagine this headrest and footrest idea when you do a chair flip. So <clears throat> now that we understand that there are two conformations of a chair, let's look at why this matters. And we'll talk about the conformational stability of a chair. So earlier we discussed that generally, Equatorial groups are more stable than axial. And let's see what that looks like in action. Now, if we had two chairs like this with no substituents on them, 
they would exist in a 50-50 equilibrium, as they're both equally stable. So we could say we could call one form the alpha form and the beta form, and both of these forms would exist in a perfect equilibrium. But now let's add these groups here, two methyl groups on carbon 1 and 3. First, I'll put this one up axial, since it's on a wedge, and carbon 3 will also be up axial. Now, imagine we pull down the headrest and pull up our footrest. We can see that carbon 1 is now on the bottom right, so we avoided the common mistake. This is going to now be equatorial going up, and carbon 3 will be equatorial going up. So that's great. We've correctly done the chair flip here. But now we could say that, well, this actually has two axial substituents. And you can see that they're in the carbon on carbons 1 and 3, we call this a 1-3 diaxial strain, since they're both on the axial position. They're both projecting up to the same place. And these are going to have a massive steric problem. They're going to be in the same space. So that means that we could predict that this molecule, or this conformation of the molecule, is going to be far more stable. Now, in terms of the equilibrium, if we call this the alpha and beta form of the chair, we would say that maybe this, you know, I don't know the exact number, but let's say 75% of the time the chair would exist in this form, and 25% it would exist in this form. So understanding the stability of chairs helps you understand what the molecule actually looks like more often in the solution and which form is favored, which is something that you can't do by looking at the flat projection. Because recall, that the flat projection looks like both of these at the same time until you draw the chair out and understand the axial and, equal, or axial and equatorial positions. That is when you'll be able to do this and why we have to cover this in the course. So let's do this one more example to introduce this concept of something called the locking group. Our final example to send us home here. So on carbon one here, we have a tert butyl group. So that's a carbon on a wedge going up axial, connected to three other methyl groups. Now this is a very large group. Not only do we have these carbons, each one is also connected to its three hydrogens. So this is a massive group. Now carbon three, we have a dashed line. Since the axial position on carbon three is going upwards, then it's going to have to be equatorial. Carbon four is a wedge. Since the axial position is going down, it's going to have to be equatorial. And carbon five is also going to have to be equatorial. So here we see that we have three equatorial methyl groups, but this one very bulky group up top. Drawing the chair flip, We'll change all of these, but since the numbering is correct, I can flip them all just from axial to equatorial or vice versa. So this will be equatorial. The methyl groups will all be axial. And you can see that they all agree with the wedges and the dashes of the flat projection. So between these two chairs, this might be a bit tricky. We can see that we have three axial positions here and only one axial position on this molecule. However, these are not made equally, and there's actually something important to know about this terp-butyl group, and that is that it is so big and bulky that when you try to do the chair flip, this actually gets in the way. When in the boat conformation, we can imagine drawing this quickly, that terp-butyl group is gonna be so big and bulky that it just won't be able to fit. What this does is it prevents the chair flip from even happening. So this is no longer possible, meaning that this, oh, my apologies, this is no longer possible. So the terp butyl group is not going to ever be able to be in the axial position. It's going to be forced in the equatorial position at all times. So what this means is that we're going to be locked into this conformation. Even though we have more axial methyl groups, we can say that the equilibrium will favor 100% of this form and 0% of this form. And that's the idea of the tert butyl group acting as a conformational locking group, locking you in to one conformation, the conformation where it is the most stable. So hopefully these examples have been helpful in understanding the chair flip and conformational stability.